final surrender of Japan hadn't even been signed when internal discussions were taking place within the US Navy as to what to do about the newly deployed atomic weapons. Although deeply flawed, Billy Mitchell's tests of aerial bombardment in the aftermath of World War I had significant impact on public and political opinion in the subsequent years, to the overall detriment of the Navy. The US Navy saw the chance to kill two birds with one stone. By proposing to test atomic weapons on a number of spare or obsolete ships, things which they knew they already had or were about to get more of in large numbers, they could head off any attempt by a latter-day Mitchell to control the public perception of the US Navy and its vulnerability to being hit with nukes. Whilst also getting some handy real-world test data showing exactly what the actual vulnerability of both ships and their crews were in the event of atomic warfare, and thus hopefully some indicator on how to fix those vulnerabilities. This was quite important, as up to this point, there had only been three nuclear detonations, the original Trinity test and the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. None of those had been at sea or had impacted major warships. Meanwhile, the US Navy had spent much of World War II and a considerable amount of its resources improving its anti-aircraft defences to form an effective multi-layered shield against bombs, rockets and torpedoes delivered by aircraft. But the new weapon potentially threatened to undo most, if not all, of that work. High-level bombing had been in vogue at the start of the war, but had largely been abandoned against moving targets at sea, because it turned out it simply wasn't accurate enough. All of the current methods of attack, fighter bombers, dive bombers, torpedo bombers, etc., required the aircraft to get within range of at least the fleet's 5-inch heavy anti-aircraft guns, and even the more distant techniques that could launch a weapon, such as a torpedo, outside of the range of the 40mm Bofors batteries were already being addressed with the introduction of 3-inch heavy anti-aircraft guns. But a large bomber carrying an atomic weapon could conceivably fly right over the entire massed anti-aircraft battery of the US Navy without ever being at risk of so much as a scratch if some of the latest high-altitude aircraft were used. And the new jet bombers that, at least amongst the Allies, were still on the drawing board but were soon to leave it, would not only be faster but capable of flying well above the maximum engagement altitude of even the newer 5-inch 54 caliber and 6-inch dual-purpose anti-aircraft guns that were about to enter fleet service. This would mean that, absent interception by the fleet's fighters, a level bomber could drop one or more atomic weapons on a fleet with impunity. Even at lower altitudes, which opened up the range of aircraft capable of being used by quite a bit, a level bomber could still be high enough to drop a bomb which would coast forward to a degree either on its own inertia or as a glide bomb, as glide bombs and early guided anti-shipping missiles had already been invented, and this would allow weapon launch to still occur beyond anti-aircraft range in some cases because, of course, an anti-aircraft gun's coverage is, roughly speaking, a dome. So, as altitude drops, the launching aircraft simply has to be a little bit further away. Naturally, accuracy would be a bit appalling with unguided freefall or glide bombs, but if the effects of an atomic blast were large enough, it wouldn't matter that you missed by a hundred or yards or so, as even such weapons launched from such altitudes could still hit somewhere in the middle of the fleet. Fighter interception, which could of course take place beyond the range of the fleet's anti-aircraft defences, could also have something of a problem when it came to atomic bombs, as the then under development B-47 for the US and the upcoming British E-3-45 specification, which would evolve by stages into the English electric Canberra, could both make their attack runs at well over 500 miles an hour. It was assumed that any potential foe, and for that read the Soviet Union, would have similar aircraft of their own under development. And this reignited a problem that had, in part, prompted the British to develop armoured flight decks back in the 1930s, that being the time of response. Jet bombers were faster than current fighters, 
and even upcoming jet fighters deployed on the Navy's carriers, like the F-9F Panther, would only be about as quick as the bombers. From notice to launch, even in a really optimistic scenario, an F-9F would need about 15 minutes to go from getting the order to launch, actually getting airborne, and then climbing to the altitude that would be needed to make it the interception. This would mean that they'd need to spot an enemy bomber that was travelling at over 500 miles an hour at least 160 miles away just to be able to make the interception at around the time the bomber would be dropping its weapon. A combat air patrol could of course respond quicker, but combat air patrols were of necessity small, and an escorted bomber formation, or simply just a large number of bombers, could ensure that at least some of them would reach launch position. There was also the problem that even the next generation of radar that was being developed for ships, and hadn't even been deployed on them yet, was not actually able to see targets out to 160 miles. Of course, this is a relatively simplistic analysis of the situation, as the deployment of radar picket destroyers or a ring of early AWACS aircraft, which at that point came in the form of TBM-3W Avengers, might extend that window of detection somewhat. But that only made an impossible situation somewhat manageable, and added additional complexity into the system. And of course, as attacks against Franklin and Pennsylvania had proved during the latter stages of World War II, even if you had extensive radar coverage, it didn't necessarily mean you'd spot everything coming up at you. This all added up to the obvious conclusion that in any future war against a high-tech opponent, it was entirely possible that the fleets of the United States Navy might end up facing atomic bombardment against which it might not have an effective defence. Although, of course, radar fighters, air-to-air -air and surface-to-air weapons, some of which would themselves end up containing atomic warheads, would also advance to try to meet the threat. In theory, the threat itself would also evolve. As it turned out, the US Navy was entirely correct to be concerned about a latter-day Billy Mitchell, as shortly after they began their own discussions, both politicians and the US Army Air Force independently came up with the same sort of idea. Only in their case they wanted to prove the vulnerability of ships as opposed to assessing their durability. However, Admiral King played something of a masterstroke. Whilst the others were calling for tests looking at using a handful of ships, maybe a dozen at most, in late October 1945 King announced a plan to use up to a hundred ships in a huge test that would not only allow assessment of the general durability of ships in as a whole, but the durability of different kinds of ships at different ranges, a far more comprehensive test. Almost immediately, of course, there were arguments over who got to be in charge, but since King had committed so many naval resources to the idea, the Navy was then easily able to argue that, with it being the biggest contributor, it should also be in charge of the nominally joint operation, since it would be the Army, in the guise of the United States Army Air Forces, which would be supplying the bombs. The US Air Force was still a couple of years out. This didn't stop the arguments, of course. Quite, quite how densely packed the ships should be was one of them. The Army wanted them to be nice and close together so they could take out as many of them at once, uh, the Navy wanted them to be spaced out a bit more accurately, reflecting formations at sea, as well as allowing the effects of blasts at ranges other than point-blank to be assessed. And then there was the case of, should the ships be fully loaded with fuel and munitions, reflecting how they would be stocked in wartime? Albeit, of course, they wouldn't have any damage control crews aboard. Or should they effectively be emptied, which would allow for assessment of structural damage, and thus estimation could be made as to what effects on the fuel and ammunition loads might be if those magazines had been compromised? You can guess which side was arguing for which there as well. Eventually, President Truman actually had to step in to put a third party in as oversight, these being civilians, theoretically without a foot in either camp. And that was just the internal issues. As news of the tests got out, 
even more people found things to complain about. There was debate over whether live atomic bomb tests in peacetime would cow the USSR, or would make them more aggressive in their search for an atomic weapon of their own. Others objected to the costs of the ships being used, which led to a further sub-argument of how exactly did one evaluate the cost of a ship that would probably otherwise be scrapped, and what ships in particular would be selected as targets. Then there was the question of, would this large-scale practical test have any results that couldn't just be accounted for in lab testing, which would be considerably cheaper. And there was an adjacent objection that even if they went ahead with this massive demonstration, the test wasn't really representative of actual conditions, because whilst it would show quite extensively what happened to ships targeted by atomic weapons, it wouldn't show what the effects of blast and radiation on the crew were. And then when it was pointed out that no sane person would ever put humans on a ship that was theoretically about to take an atomic bomb to the face, a whole other argument spun out about the ethics of using animals as stand-ins. The US Navy's response to all of this was actually mostly to ignore it, other than to include the animal testing, which hadn't previously been considered, and then press on with looking for a site suitable for the tests while they waited for the politicians and the civilians to stop the internal and external fighting previously mentioned. They soon found a, relatively speaking, perfect test site, Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. It was nominally under US control, having been captured from the Japanese during World War II, being a reasonable size atoll that enclosed a significant sheltered harbour, which would be key given how many unmanned ships would be anchored there, they didn't want them wandering off. The weather was relatively good most of the time. It was in range of a base that was capable of handling the B-29 bombers that would have to drop the actual bombs. And it was far enough from major inhabited areas that fallout shouldn't be an issue. Likewise, it was relatively clear of most of the major shipping lanes. About the only negative was that the area was populated, if sparsely, but the locals seemed to be amenable to being relocated, although exactly how willing they were at first is occasionally the matter of debate and contention, and certainly what happened to them immediately afterwards is not pleasant reading. But with the location established, plans moved ahead quickly for the US military was in the middle of a massive demobilization and there were significant concerns that sufficient manpower might not be available within a year, especially that of the specialist atomic scientists who would fairly soon be working privately and may either refuse to come back or would cost a fortune to hire back off of the various private institutions they'd be teaching at. By February 1946, a channel and a deep water anchorage were being formed by liberal use of explosives, whilst the target fleet was being assembled. Charles P. Minton, aboard the USS Thompson, recalled, I was on the USS Thompson, DMS-38, a converted flush deck destroyer when she was on her way home from Japan to San Francisco. We received a change in orders at Saipan to escort a squadron of small motor minesweepers to Bikini. We entered the lagoon on the 7th of March, 1946, and saw the natives being evacuated from Bikini to Rongarik Atoll, aboard LST-1108. Thompson and her minesweeper Chicks swept the east part of the lagoon for Japanese mines, but found none. What we found were coral heads, which wrecked our equipment. The orders sending us to Bikini were sealed and stamped secret. One night, we asked the radio man to pipe us some music, and he picked up a station in Minneapolis. Were we surprised when we heard a news item about crossroads in some detail? Talk about being secret. The target fleet included no less than five battleships, the captured Japanese Nagato and the American Nevada, Pennsylvania, New York, and Arkansas, the oldest battleships in the US Navy, with the exception of USS Texas, which was still on active duty at the time that the plans were being drawn up. There were also four cruisers, the oldest US heavy cruisers, Pensacola and Salt Lake City, along with the German heavy cruiser Prince Eugen, and the Japanese Sakawa, which was a Nagano-class light cruiser. 
Carriers were represented by the older USS Saratoga and the much newer, if somewhat smaller, light carrier USS Independence. There were 13 destroyers on the target list, which were a grab bag of older types, ranging from representatives of the Mahan class all the way through to the immediately pre-war Sims class. Submarines were a bit more interesting, though. Whilst all the other categories were entirely made up of ships that were either obsolete or entirely unneeded, the eight submarines present included the somewhat worn USS Sea Raven SS-196, which was a salmon class built just before World War II, but also five wartime-built and much newer Balao class, the Dentuda, Parch, Pilotfish, Skate, and Apagon. The bulk of the targets, though, were a wide range of landing craft, landing ships, and transports of various makes and models. A small amount of fuel and munitions were included aboard the relevant ships, this was enough that they would be set off if their compartments were breached, but in theory, not enough to cause the ships to sink outright if they did go up. Plus, numerous sensors to see how the ships themselves behaved, how much radiation there was in the various areas, and if overpressure would be a major threat outside of the exposed parts of the ship. There was also an even larger fleet of active vessels, mostly transports of various descriptions, but which was included a couple of destroyer squadrons and the heavy cruiser USS Fall River. Broadly, this support fleet could be divided into patrol and coordination, which was most of the mainline warships, service and accommodation, which was mostly transports, an air group, which included the carrier Shangri-La that controlled various drones and would be primarily responsible for aerial photography, a transport group which moved everybody around, and an array of vessels which would move the target ships into, and potentially if they survived, out of position, as well as assess various radiation levels and try to decontaminate the ships if possible. This latter group also had an array of small craft and small ships rigged up as remote control drones to try and assess radiation without having to put people in harm's way in the immediate aftermath, of any given blast. A number of B-17 bombers were also converted to radio control, which would allow them to be flown in close and potentially even through the mushroom clouds which experience told them should result. Three 23 kiloton nuclear bombs were notionally made available, although only two would be needed for the 1946 tests, with the plan being that the first of the two major tests, ABLE, would be an air burst representing the most likely atomic warhead to be directed at ships at that time, and followed up by Baker, in which the bomb would be suspended 90 foot below the surface and then detonated, representing either an airdropped weapon with a delay fuse, or a nuclear sea mine, or potentially even a deep running nuclear torpedo. A third test. Charlie was planned for 1947, and in that they planned to detonate a bomb much deeper, with a smaller target fleet, to represent the effect of a nuclear depth charge or a nuclear torpedo that was being used in a submarine versus submarine engagement. Test Able was duly scheduled for July the 1st, 1946, and a B-29, in fact the one that had been the photography aircraft in the bombing of Nagasaki, took off with an atomic weapon aboard ostensibly to help them with aiming, but according to some sailors as also a little bit of a middle finger salute to the US Army Air Force and just what the Navy thought of their ability to hit the broadside of a barn, the battleship Nevada, which was to be the target point for the test, had been painted a lurid bright orange, ostensibly to help the bomber know what to aim for. Whilst the three previous atomic explosions had established that they weren't actually about to set the Earth's atmosphere on fire, there was still some debate over what effects bombs over the ocean would actually have. Radioman Stuart Hepburn was manning one of the main communication stations at the time and recalled, While I was on duty in the radio shack, I received dispatches quoting scientists that included comments on the probabilities of a tidal wave all the way to chain reactions that might obliterate the entire task force. 
We were told in no uncertain terms to not take this information outside of the radio room. In the argument relating to how closely the ships were to be packed together, the US Army Air Force had managed to get a little bit more of their way than the US Navy. The target ships were generally clustered far closer together than they normally would be, and especially so toward the centre, where all, almost all the big ticket items were, with lines of destroyers, landing craft and transports snaking out from the aiming point. Notices were posted on all ships informing those who wanted to watch the detonation of an atomic weapon at reasonably close range of the appropriate safety procedures. Safety precautions and actions on test rehearsal days will be governed by the following schedule. At 30 minutes to go, all hands to quarters. At 5 minutes to go, read special safety precautions to all hands over 1 MC from Khan. At 2 minutes to go, all hands. 1. Face away from bikini as ordered over 1 MC. 2. Sit on deck. 3. Close eyes tightly. 4. Cover eyes with bended arm against the face. At some point thereafter, carry on when word is passed on 1 MC. At this signal, all hands may safely observe the beautiful display of colors in the incandescent column of cloud and the gigantic clouds which follow the explosion. In roared the B-29, down went the bomb, and they missed. And it wasn't a small miss either, it was a miss of almost half a mile. Against stationary targets, that was awful. Everyone from the Royal Air Force to the Luftwaffe to the Japanese Navy to the Regia Aeronautica had regularly gotten bombs a lot closer than that in the early days of World War II when they'd been trying to level bomb moving targets at sea. And as the mushroom cloud faded, the result seemed to be that the target fleet, at least initially, was mostly fine. Albeit that did change a little bit as the first manned vessels drew in to take stock. Louis Brents was aboard the USS Fall River. We had our eyes covered with our forearms and leaned forward on our raised knees. I still saw the flash of light of the explosion even though my eyes were covered and my back was to the target. I've wondered if my late-in-life development of cataracts may have been triggered by this experience. John Riley, meanwhile, was playing a slightly looser game with the definition of following instructions. I was standing in front of the hangar deck with the newsreel people. We just shaded our eyes with our hands. I remember seeing the Pennsylvania's bow being lifted out of the water. Still, although a lot of ships were damaged, sinkings were limited. The closest ship to the detonation, which had occurred about 500 foot up in the air, was the transport Gilliam which sank almost immediately. The transport Carlisle, the destroyers Lamson and Anderson, and the cruiser Sakawa would also eventually sink, although it was immediately noted that the first four ships, the two transports and the destroyers, were somewhat lightly built, and Carlisle, Lamson and Anderson had all been close and almost broadside on to the blast, the shockwave passing through the air having done most of the damage. Sakawa was stern first to the explosion, but her hull was surprisingly intact, even for a light cruiser. Her superstructure after the bridge was a crushed mess, granted, and she was on fire, but she would still take a couple of days to actually sink. Many other ships within a thousand yard radius had various extents of damage, but being more end on than side on to the explosion, they were generally found to have been damaged, but still afloat. It should be qualified, though, that often this superficial damage in terms of water tightness was still at least visually quite impressive. The submarine Skate, for example, was in almost the same position both in terms of relative angle and distance to the explosion as the Sakawa, but whilst her tough pressure hull survived, her outer casing was a bit of a mess, to put it lightly. But it did seem that a well-built ship was remarkably tough, whilst some of the superstructure on the battleships Nevada, Arkansas and Nagato did look like an angry giant had taken a swat at them, their turrets, hulls and even the stronger elements of the upper works appeared to be intact, as was the case on a number of other ships. Even on the Independence, which was badly on fire, 
it could clearly be seen where the hull of the cruiser she was built on ended, which was mostly fine, and where the lightweight hangar and flight deck that had been added to it had begun. Uh, this was the bit that was all smashed up and burning. The somewhat more distant Saratoga had similar issues in the lighter built parts of her upper works, but not to the same degree, although a spreading fire didn't help things in that regard. Whilst the US Air Army Air Force went off to puzzle over quite how they'd flubbed dropping an atomic bomb that badly, the US Navy moved in to check on its test instruments. To their surprise, they found that only about 10% of the test animals had died, mostly due to overpressure, although another 15% would succumb over the following days to a variety of lethal radiation doses. One animal, labelled as pig number 311, caused quite a degree of consternation. It had been supposed to be stationed on the Sakawa, a ship with a relatively high animal body count in the aftermath, but it appeared soul amongst its fellows to be in perfectly fine health. Eventually, it transpired that number 311 had probably just absented itself from proceedings during the pre-test drop-offs and remained aboard the animal transport ship well away from the blast, turning up in the headcount afterwards because the same ship had been used to collect the various test animals, including those from Sakawa. The armour of the battleships turned out to actually have remarkable radiation-stopping properties. Out on deck, the radiation dosage was about 10,000 rem, but deep in the ships, this was reduced to by about 90%. In the turrets, the drop in radiation, which would have mostly come through the roof armour, meant that the animals placed in there lived about twice as long as those that had been stationed out on the decks. Uh, these lasted a couple of days after the blast before radiation sickness took them. However... Even a 1,000 rem dose deep in the engineering space was about twice the lethal dosage for a human. This, in turn, led to a rather grim conclusion. A heavily built ship that was maybe half a mile to a mile away from a 23 kiloton nuclear weapon in airburst mode would almost certainly survive in a shape that could allow it to fight and sail in some manner, albeit the blast would probably render most of its radar and optical suite destroyed. The ship would also be in a condition that a refitting would be possible, as long as you didn't mind some of the ship itself being mildly radioactive thanks to neutron activation, but the crew would die from radiation poisoning in relatively short order. The engineering crew might live long enough to get the ship clear of the immediate combat zone for recovery, maybe even to a forward base, like in the Pacific War, say, Ulithi. But whoever was sent aboard to take over control of the ship afterwards would be walking into a gigantic floating graveyard. But time was pressing on, and within a couple of days, various ships were being moved around to their test positions for Shot Baker. A few new target ships were brought in, partly to make up for those that had sunk, and fires on the various ships closest to the able detonation were put out in fairly short order. LSM-60 was the lucky ship that was to be anchored in the middle of the fleet, and the Baker bomb lowered over the side on a long cable. Obviously this time there was no chance of a miss, short of the reappearance of a megalodon with a particular appetite for steel cable, and at 0835 on July the 25th, the bomb was detonated. Unlike Abel, the water attenuated the usual fireball enough that pictures of the explosion were possible almost from the instant of detonation. LSM-60 rather obviously immediately ceased to exist, and nine other ships would end up being sunk, famously including the battleship Arkansas, which was at one point thought to be visible in this photo, supposedly upended by the blast which had occurred less than its own length away. But in more recent analysis, especially of the wreck of Arkansas, it's thought that this dark shape, whilst related to her, is in fact a mixture of the shadow cast by the hole in the water column, with the ship still out of sight lower down, along with a mix of dirt, paint, and dislodged soot, which had been knocked free by the blast wave. However, 
just to be clear, the original idea that this is Arkansas up on its end doesn't come purely from a few people looking at the still of a film reel, as one of the eyewitnesses recalled. I was up on the superstructure of the Fall River by fire control. I had a good view of the Baker blast. I saw the Arkansas go up in the air and break in two. I didn't see it come down because of the cloud. Which I suppose goes to show, with thousands of eyewitnesses, you are going to get some conflicting and potentially slightly incorrect accounts. Nonetheless, also sunk were the submarines Pilotfish, Skipjack and Appagun, the Euler Y0160 and the floating dry dock ARDC-13, along with the carrier Saratoga, which was itself barely out of the radius of the water column that was thrown up by the blast. The three submarines had been submerged and parts of their pressure hulls had simply been crushed, whilst much further out the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen was damaged, initially afloat, but had become far too radioactive to board, which would lead to her eventual loss due to slow leaks sometime later. As with Abel, simply being afloat didn't mean that the ships were undamaged. The shockwave of the detonation travelling through the water caused significant underwater hull damage to the hulls of many of the target ships. This was then compounded by a rather large wave of water displaced by the blast, which lifted some of the smaller ships and drove them along, some of them fetching all the way up into the atoll. And that was then followed by a third destructive effect, as most of the water that had been blown into the sky began to fall back down as gravity looked up, realised something was amiss, and rather poignantly reasserted itself, thus creating a rolling wave of water and spray that tore apart superstructures, stripped off radar and comms arrays, rolled ships around, partially flooded them, and of course absolutely soaked them with radioactive particulate matter. Most of the ships, with notable exceptions like Arkansas, would take some time to sink, if they sank at all, from gradual flooding, the contamination from the final surge of radioactive water having made it pretty much impossible for damage control crews to get aboard the closest ships, which were of course the most damaged. The contamination from this last wave actually extended quite some distance, pretty much enveloping the entire target fleet to varying degrees and hosing down the ships with high-pressure wash only reduced this radioactivity somewhat, and it proved impossible to eliminate in most of the badly contaminated ships. In fact, one of the fire ships that was used had to be decommissioned afterwards because it had so much radioactive particulate matter dropped onto it by the backblast of its own hoses. Radio man Stanley Smith, meanwhile, was left in a little bit of a quandary after Test Baker due to a little bit of misplaced confidence. After Abel, there wasn't much damage to the Sarah. A few fires on the flight deck and some dead test animals. We went back aboard for about two weeks and decided Sarah was unsinkable. So a couple of buddies and I elected to leave our full sea bags aboard until after Baker. Seven plus hours after Baker, we watched Sarah sink from a troop ship with tears in our eyes. As she slipped under the surface, I don't know what mattered most, my ship or my gear. Shortly after that, I was transferred to the Fall River with a ditty bag my sole possession. Due to the triple punch of the detonation, as well as the much more extensive and long-lived radioactive contamination and the surges of water, the Baker test also killed most of the animal test subjects found aboard. Indeed, a little over a fortnight after the detonation, the cleanup effort was halted completely when it became clear that a vastly greater degree of contamination had occurred than even the worst case estimates had provided for. Uh, for example, rather famously, a fish caught in the lagoon turned out to have ingested enough radioactive contaminants that it could perform its own x-ray simply by being in the presence of radioactively sensitive film. Most of the Geiger counters in the fleet overloaded and stopped working, and the monitoring badges, dosimeters and other equipment that were attached to various crew members were returned with a worrying number of severe exposure readings. And this was on top of the fact that there wasn't actually any inability in the fleet to detect plutonium, over 10 pounds of which had been atomized and broadly scattered about the fleet. The contamination of the target fleet was one of the reasons that the Charlie test ended up being cancelled, 
and the still afloat portion of the fleet, which to be fair was the majority of them, was then towed off to varying fates. Some were brought back for the US for detailed inspection and mostly ultimately futile attempts to decontaminate them in the case of those closest to the blast. Others were towed off to a nearby atoll for further attempts at decontamination and some analysis. A few, mostly those that were further out, were even actually cleansed enough to be put back into service, although a considerable amounts of sandblasting was required. Many, however, would be scuttled at various sites in and around the Marshall Islands, or in the next few years expended in deep water sink axes, like the USS New York and Nevada. Shockingly, given the lack of knowledge about some elements of the fallout, the aforementioned complete inability to measure the presence of plutonium on site, and the generally primitive state of counter-radiation measures, whilst exposure to the tests has, of course, over time resulted in an increase in mortality amongst those present, it seems to, quote-unquote, only hover at around a 5% increase in mortality. Although, of course, how many additional health problems are suffered by those who otherwise have lived out a natural lifespan seems to be a subject that is somewhat less well enumerated, at least in the studies that I could find. Much to the US Army Air Force's disappointment, it had turned out that warships were actually far more durable in the face of atomic blasts than had previously been thought, especially when the dispersion was scaled to that which fleets would typically deploy at in real-life operations. It turned out that even a 23-kiloton atom bomb would, if accurately delivered, likely only kill the ship it had been aimed at, albeit that would be one very dead ship. For the other ships nearby, superstructure damage, i.e. a mission kill given the accompanying loss of sensor equipment, would be the main hazard for nearby ships, but radiation, whether directly or in the form of fallout, would be the biggest risk to the fleet in general. There was a limited amount that could be done for this, since covering all the ships with layers of lead wasn't really an option, but the inverse square law was their friend when it came to the drop-off in intensity of radiation, and so a battleship, say, on escort to a carrier, assuming the carrier had been hit by the nuke, would probably at least have the crew that were in the armoured spaces of the ship survive long-term. But more proactively, the sealing of ships, or at least key parts of them, to what we would today call an NBC-proof standard, would help mitigate direct fallout contamination, whilst a spray system would be installed on new build ships and occasionally refitted onto older ships, which would hopefully prevent the worst of the particulate fallout from settling on the ships that had the equipment installed, as hopefully the particulate matter would be washed away before it could work its way into crevices and other hard-to-reach areas on the ships, which had been where most of the particulate matter had collected in the test baker vessels. This would at least allow the crews who didn't immediately receive a fatal radiation dose to have something of a fighting chance, even if it was just to get their ships back home. Improvements to anti-aircraft defences, as well as the greater effectiveness of the Baker test, would mean that whilst some nuclear shells and missiles designed for ship-to-ship -ship combat would end up being produced, a lot of focus in the field would instead go into nuclear-tipped torpedoes and other forms of underwater nuclear weaponry, those kinds of weapons generally having a higher carrying capacity than shells anyway, and a lesser chance of being intercepted compared to a missile. But, luckily for me, the more advanced types of anti-shipping nuclear-equipped weapons are beyond the scope of this channel's coverage, so we can draw something of a line there. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.